Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Yuri Young, and we're just about to start AGO's latest professional development workshop. But first, I would like to acknowledge the land the AGO is on is Michi Sage Nishnab territory. It is also governed by a treaty between the, the Mississauga of the Credit and the Canadian government. Toronto is Michi Sage Nishnab territory. It has also been occupied by other Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat Confederacies. Today is also Earth Day, so I invite you all to take a brief moment to thank the land from which you are currently tuning in on. I know one of our panelists are from all the way, hailing all the way from Brussels right now, so we just take a very brief moment to give thanks. And while in the spirit of thank, thanking people, um, the AGO Times X RBC Emerging Artists Workshop is generously supported by the RBC. So thank you to our partners at RBC. We're here to discuss trends and issues in self-representation, digital art, and career development. Our panelists today will provide practical advice for emerging artists looking for opportunities of growth and mentorship. These are the following questions that we'll be addressing throughout our Q&A, um, but before that, we will be having presentations from each of the panelists, sharing a little bit about who they are and what they do and why they're here today. So without further ado, we'll start with Rebecca Carbon. Although I, this is an impressive bio, I am just going to throw it to her in order to um, introduce better introduce herself. So Rebecca please take the floor. Okay, thanks very much, Megan. Um, I'm also not gonna read my own bio because that's that's embarrassing, um, but I will uh, put up my own slides. This will stop others screen sharing. Yes, I want to continue. Um, and uh, I wanted to just say uh, thanks very much for inviting me to be in conversation with you um, today. I'm looking forward to speaking about the questions, um, but I just thought I would put together a few slides that establish my, the perspective that I bring to the conversation that we're going to have today, um, and really start with stating very plainly that art is work. Um, we think about or as an object often, um, but it's really important throughout this conversation in particular about building and sustaining a career in the arts to think about um, to think about this as a verb, that art is work. It requires labor and time to make art. Um, and people watching this program, of course, are very much aware of this, but it's worth repeating as it kind of underscores the approach that I'll be bringing to the questions that we have um, been asked to consider in our conversation today. I was just about to ask somebody to switch the slides, but that's me. Um, so there are two sides, of course, to making it as an artist. Um, there is the, the work of making art, and there is the work of making a living at doing that. Um, there's the creation, and this is really, um, you know, this really is work, as I said before, and there's the communication, making sure that people know about your work. Um, that is the work of getting your work out there. It is communicating and promoting your work. Um, and it's a lot about, that's a lot of what our talk kind of centers on today, but both of these roles can really be full-time occupations. And so how to balance the need to, the need to make work with the need to, um, uh, to make it work as an artist, to kind of be able to financially support yourself in making the work is a really interesting balance. And it's really something that I'm, I'm really pleased that the AGO uh, and RBC are holding this conversation uh, to help emerging artists think about that balance. Um, you know, artists today are are really required to be their own agents in many ways, their own um, promoters. And while on the one hand, there's unprecedented uh, tools and possibilities for, for doing that, for enabling artists to have their work seen, um, there's also, you know, we know that there's a difference between selling work for immediate cash purposes and selling work for the establishment of a career trajectory. Um, and these are two different activities that I think we'll talk about um, that later today. I'm really looking forward to hearing what my fellow, fellow panelists have to say about that. Um, making it as an artist with an income is challenging. Making it as an artist becomes part of an establishment um, of a contemporary art scene and even then survives as an art historical artist or something that's seen by future generations is, is even harder. 
Um, so, and having that idea of having your work uh, seen and talked about, written about, uh, presented, represented uh, by more established critics and curators is, is the route that you kind of want to think about as you're, as you're thinking about a sustainable, fostering a sustainable career. Um, and it's interesting thinking about how Instagram can be used to create a sense of like, of exposure and people becoming familiar with your work and how do you use that and balance that uh, with this kind of longer term view for how your work is presented and seen. So I thought it would be interesting, um, you know, just having looked at the questions talking about, uh, I work on a bunch of different projects, but there's a couple, very two very different ones, um, uh, in relation to the questions that we're talking about today. One is a program um, that I'm working with through uh, Artworks TO, which is Toronto's Year of Public Art. I've been involved in um, that project broadly for a few years from developing the framework and guiding principles to the kind of implementation and then some actual program aspects. And one of those programs um, is the Artworks TO Spotlight Emerging Artist Program, which is also uh, supported by RBC. Um, and this is a program where we really are looking at uh, emerging artists featuring uh, 52 artists over the course of the year, where artists are asked to submit um, a video talking about their work uh, that gets posted and promoted through these channels. They get a, a small honorarium. And then really, really importantly, um, they are matched with a mentor in their field uh, with whom they can meet and have conversations about, about their work. And I think that's that mentorship aspect is something that we're talking about today. And it really is something um, not to be underestimated in terms of trying to think about how you build that, um, build that sustainable career trajectory. Um, and then the other project that I wanted to talk about was very different um, from the Spotlight Emerging project and kind of different from a lot of things um, is a program that uh, I found, a platform that I founded a few years ago that's an artwork production platform um, that uh, basically work, develops limited editions projects with um, kind of mid-career and established artists that only go into production once the edition has already been sold to some to, to collectors. So it creates a situation um, when I talk about that balance between promoting for kind of immediate purposes and promoting for the longer term, it creates a situation where artists are able to work on something within their practice without the pressure of thinking about whether or not it's going to sell right away and thinking about instead what that long, where it fits in in a longer term. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this platform in relation to what we're talking about today is that a lot of the, um, a lot of the platform kind of centers around this idea of bringing, bringing supporters and collectors into the production process and telling them the story behind the making of work. So rather than thinking about artwork as that kind of, that thing at the end, um, you know, you recognize that actually that's only a small slice and what has actually been a very long project development as artists work through different concerns and research aspects and, you know, all sorts of tangential things that somehow come together to become this artwork at the end. So bringing supporters and collectors into that conversation um, does a lot to build that understanding of the creative process. So you're kind of, uh, with this platform, you're, you're supporting, um, you're kind of buying a share in that creative process rather than just buying the, the product at the end. Um, and that's been really interesting in terms of developing relationships with collectors and, um, um, and that kind of support. And then I just wanted to top off, uh, you know, and hand over to my other panelists with this uh, Instagram post that was actually posted by Akin somewhere deep pandemic, uh, when was it? January 30th, 2021. Because um, I just think there's a couple of things to think about when we're looking at, um, you know, making work as an artist. Uh, one is to think, is to recognize that artists, artists need to make work. It's a necessary part of their, of their being in the world. Um, and two is to kind of the, acknowledge the unfortunate fact that um, there seems to, there's often a kind of predominant thinking that because artists get to make the work that is their passion, they somehow you know, getting paid for that properly is gravy on top. And really, we really need to recognize um, the labor involved and the importance of that labor and um, not think about artists being paid as gravy, but actually an essential part of being able to foster a thriving art community. Because um, the third point, as this Instagram uh, post points out, is that um, artists work, whether it's uh, visual or music or poetry or dance, um, is really what enables the rest of us to understand 
what we're all going through um, and, and the complexities of our own existence. And it's an essential part of the human condition. So, um, so we need to really kind of support ways of enabling artists to keep that keep those careers going in a sustainable way. I'm going to hand over. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and hand back over to Megan to hand it over to our next panelist. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, as I find my, it has to be here, right? Nope, that's not it. Sorry, stop sharing. Sorry, my dog is obvious. So I also, let me actually say this. I'll have all our panelists on here at the moment. I'm terrible at introducing myself. <laughs> so I forgot because I immediately wanted to hear what everyone had to say. Um, and also ending on that note, Rebecca, about um, that post, I feel like I saw that multiple times throughout the pandemic, even now to this day. And it was such a, it is really truly such a beautiful reminder of our need for creativity, for art, um, just on a human level. And um, it's actually what brought me into the art space. Um, first and foremost, I am a dog mom and this 11 month old puppy just won't leave me alone. So I apologize. Uh, second of all, I've been in the media space for nearly 15 years. And one thing that I loved about storytelling in particular is that I've had the fortune of experimenting in different media spaces and platforms, Instagram being one of them, as Rebecca also noted, the power of that platform occasionally, um, while also coming back full circle to my interest in wellness, art, and amplifying other voices. I have to say, I'm really excited, um, especially after hearing from Rebecca, to hear what each of our panelists have to share today, because in my heart, I am an emerging artist trapped in a body that has no talent. But it's been a pleasure finding a niche within the art community here in Toronto, and specifically with the AGO. Um, and that is my intro that I was very excited to share and I completely forgot. And while, uh, I don't know why, oh, I know what I did. It went away when, um, uh, there we go. Does that, oh, hold on, sorry. I know what I had done, I did now. There we go. Slideshow. Oops. Um, so now without further ado, uh, I would love to introduce Lauren, um, the panelist that's hailing from Brussels. If you can take the floor and introduce yourself, let me know if you want me to stop sharing my screen and if you wanna share yours immediately. Yeah, thank you. I will share my screen. Okay. Um, oh, perfect. Oops, no, actually, I want to do slideshow play from start. Okay, is everything you can see everything you can hear me. Great. So thank you for that. I really appreciated starting the, the talk on this, um, this uh, sentiment that art is work. I think that's a really important thing to consider. Um, so I'll just say briefly about myself and then go into some details of what I'm up to. Um, I'm a curator and writer originally from Vancouver, um, but now I'm based in Brussels. I've had sort of a securitist route here. Um, I did my BFA at UBC in art history and women's and gender studies. And then I did my criticism and curatorial practices MFA at OCAD. I actually, it's really nice to be hosted by the AGO. I did a uh, curatorial internship there like 10 years ago in the Department of Canadian Art. So it's nice to be back. Um, since then, I've worked all over the Banff Center, the Barbican Art Gallery in London, Freeze Projects, the Carnegie Museum of Art. Um, but most recently, I started working with MOMAS, um, the online art publication. I started working with Sky Gooden, who is the founder and publisher of MOMAS, um, on a series of podcasts. Uh, we actually did our, our MFA together at OCAD, and that's how we met. Um, and so we started doing this series of podcasts that was talking to artists and writers and architects and curators. Um, and the idea is that we have genuine and accessible conversations with important members of the art world. So there you can see some examples of who we've been speaking to. Um, these conversations and my work with, uh, with Sky and Momus um, has led to 
uh, a more fulsome engagement with MOMIS where I have been participating as associate director for the MOMIS Emerging Critics Residency. So I know this panel is for artists, but I think um, we can also talk to writers. And I know that there are a lot of artists who have writing practices and, you know, this is a very hyphenate field. So um, just to give an idea of what the MOMIS Emerging Critics Residency is, uh, we are attending to art criticism in from publications like MOMIS, so smaller not-for-profit ad hoc um, that are most um, commonly now based online. Um, art publishing is uh, being part of very pressing conversations regarding practices and ethics in art. Um, so over the pandemic, there's been a swell in independently pub published criticism um, in a field that is already very, very precarious. Um, so for instance, in the pand pandemic years, art publications froze their freelance budgets for the most part. Um, and there's also been um, a turn to our editors seeking to platform historically undervalued writers and persons, but also often taking liberties with their bylines, doing damage to unique and vulnerable voices, and also gatekeeping um, to the exclusion of important positions and questions. So we were also seeing um, a situation where MFAs, uh, you know, have an enormous financial barrier and are not really addressing um, really pressing issues of how to professionally engage as a creative person, um, as a career. So what we're trying to do is more transparently chart opportunities, revitalize potential in the field of art writing and, you know, better identifying risks essentially. Um, so one of the um, one of the main concerns is uh, having people of color um, given opportunities and welcomed into spaces that are traditionally reserved for white men. Um, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of attention paid to this. I mean, this is Antoine Sargent who says it quite perfectly that. Um, uh, basically we're in the middle of a renaissance of black artistic production and you're telling me the best people to evaluate that is, are the same ones who basically ignored black artists for decades. So this is Antoine pointing out a really serious disparity in who is talking about whom. Um, and so, sorry, one of our, I'll just say, in 2019, um, we began hosting these residencies twice annually um, to address the heightened stakes, as I said, increased potential, and to do so outside of a traditional MFA program. Um, so these economically accessible mentorship programs give prof professional counsel, extended seasons of editorial care, and the residents lead to ongoing conversations and collaborations. Um, one of the things that we're really focusing on now is it used to be that Sky and I would host the residencies and now what we're trying to do is invite people of color to author and lead the residencies so that there is a there is a consistent voice throughout that is not white. Um, so most recently we just hosted our fifth residency. This was led by um, Leolia Shragi, who's a curator and artist, um, Samoan, and they offered this to an exclusively emerging indigenous criti critics, writers, curators, historians, and publishers. Um, so the model is that Leili would invite a different session leader for the two, two week program and every day participants have the opportunity to learn from a different person. Um, this is, you know, the residencies are entirely funded by sort of scholarship support from a lot of different sources. Here's a list of, of who we're really thankful to for supporting it. Um, since the residencies, uh, we can see a huge increase in alumni of the residencies, um, knowing how to pitch, getting published. Um, these are a few examples of uh, alumni that have published with MOMIS subsequently. Um, we also have a partnership with iBeam, which is an organization in New York where we run a critical writing fellowship. And so this is for a writer to engage in a um, year long mentorship uh, process where they work on a very um, a very uh, developed piece of writing. So Arushi Vats was the winner and then we have the two follow um, 
the two runners up, Eugene Chung and Simon Wu. Simon Wu has been a longtime contributor to MoMAs. So these are some other, um, some other uh, pieces that he he um, contributed and for his um, for his runner up to the fellowship he contributed this really incredible article which I really encourage you to read it's about his time working with Claudia Rankin um, and the critical imaginary institute so I'll just finish up by saying um, we have just opened a call for applications to our next residency, which is authored and led by Jessica Lynn, who is a critic and writer based in New York. Um, this is a convenient convening for Black writers to take seriously, and this is uh, Jessica's Jessica's conception around this, take seriously the rigor of imagination as a creative political methodology. So the idea of the residency is called, is um, based on a text by Toni Morrison um, called The Writer Before the Page, and it's called Because My Metier is Black. So this residency comprised of writing workshops, presentations, moderated conversations. Um, so we're thinking about preoccupations, questions, and projects that the participants can bring to the residency. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of where I'm coming from and what's up with the MoMAS residencies. Um, yeah, thank you. I'll stop sharing now. And I will start sharing. That was incredible. I um, appreciate the few, a couple things stood out to me, just the multi-hyphenate, you know, the artists are, they do everything. They, they don't just create art. And then of course, art itself, it, there's so many mediums. So that was incredible. And then just include the inclusivity of your presentation really struck a chord with me. Um, Paula, our uh, AGO resident star. <laughs> I don't know about that, but um, thank you. Thank you, Megan. And, and, um, Thank you. For, I mean, how to follow. Uh, it's really um, what I uh, appreciate uh, as well is the idea of work. And, and then the, um, as you said, Megan, too, um, this idea that uh, we, we play in multiple roles as artists. Um, and certainly the writing seems to be even more important these days um, in, um, in helping to maybe communicate uh, position positionality. Um, and uh, I, I actually have a background in studio art. Uh, so I have a BFA MFA um, and have this side gig, which is a big, it's kind of my full time thing, <laughs> but, which is the art administration. <laughs> And, uh, and they, it's always been like that for me. And, and so there's a kind of inside outside for me, DIY institutional based practice. That's where I come from. Uh, it's my, it's my comfort zone, this, this kind of not being in any one place, perhaps. Um, and uh, maybe I can ask uh, Dana to share my slides. And so what I wanted to do uh, was uh, perhaps uh, I've been really, really um, I, fortunate to to be able to work with um, artists uh, in the uh, artist in residency program at the AGO for the last uh, nine, now going into my tenth year, and um, and there certainly has been changes, and I would say in particular the last two years, of course, uh, we've pivoted to an online delivery. Of, of the program, uh, but uh, one that I think uh, actually really takes up this space, this hybrid space, this sort of digital self and the, and the in-person self and how they, they are uh, very much uh, now, uh, not necessarily for everyone, but a part of what uh, a practice can look like. Um, and uh, in my work, uh, I also have the opportunity to, to read a lot of artist statements um, and proposals. And one of the things I might uh, say, or these are the five things I'd like to offer. Um, you really, uh, whenever, whenever you are communicating, um, and here, here is the, the, whether it's for work or um, for a kind of a career um, path, um, you really have to make uh, clear what, what your position is. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, that's a hard thing to do. I mean, the hardest thing I have to do is write about myself. <laughs> um, but uh, what I think if uh, for me, it's about establishing some sort of trust, whether it's a hundred word bio, 
or a longer piece um, that um, if, if you kind of step back and go back into what you're writing that you can sort of see, oh, I get, you know, I get this. I think that I'm, I'm, you know, someone can connect with my ideas in a very straightforward way. And, um, and I think it's sometimes hard to get out of your oneself. And, and, and so it's very important in my, my view um, to um, test your concept, test your bio, test your, uh, rewrite your, your, your artist statement, uh, revisit it continuously, but also share it. Uh, share it frequently, share it with people you trust, seek out mentors. I mean, what we've heard from Lauren and Rebecca are very formalized programs and uh, with the AGO as well. But, uh, but uh, there is absolute value in, uh, in uh, finding friendships and, uh, and uh, making, um, sharing those ideas. My, my first uh, gig out of uh, undergrad was a writer's group. And uh, we just got together and, and you know, did things. Um, but what it did is um, begin this, this communication, this idea that one has to communicate and, and, and receive back information. Um, the hardest thing is sometimes to keep it simple because we are actually thinking and bringing in all these other, uh, other kind of influences. Um, and so in that process, um, I can't emphasize more, even more, um, that editing, re-editing, editing, editing is really um, a key. Um, and um, with that, uh, there's also, uh, and I think there was uh, some um, mention of this as well, um, there's also an opening up of your process that can happen. You can actually share things even though they may not be that finished work. Uh, Rebecca, you mentioned that, that there's a kind of moment where um, it isn't that final moment. It's a lot of moments that can come, uh, that can come forward um, and be shared in different ways. And um, with that, I really am thinking uh, of our most current uh, artists in residence, and we'll go to the next slide, um, almost as a case study. Uh, that I'd like to share, and that the, that Eric and um, uh, Eric Shen Yang, oop, and we'll go back one one slide, and Maria Mag Magsi um, uh, have given me some tips that I want to share with you as well. Um, they're going to be speaking about their project, a wall in residence, um, next week on Tuesday. Um, it's called Dawat Yan Banquet, and um, uh, we'll go to the next slide. Um, they were uh, working on this project well before um, the residency started. And um, here you see uh, examples of uh, their, um, their blog. And um, this is a, a really great uh, kind of view of um, things that were kind of in development, being shared. Um, maybe some people were liking their friends, uh, others were starting to get to know, but they were also able to then share and test out. Um, and uh, from the blog, they uh, also, I want to share here, there was a kind of communication as they came into the um, AGO uh, in a, a virtual residency. Here you see a compilation of all their um, mentors, if you will, uh, during the three month period. So you um, uh, on the top left is um, Donna, who is coordinator, curator of the residency program. Um, and then um, Mariam uh, just uh, to the right of her. Um, and um, these are all um, folks. And then Eric is on the bottom left. But all of these folks are um, individuals who met uh, with Eric and Donna as they were developing their project. Um, but what you see are curators, Europe, uh, curator of European art, um, uh, conservator, uh, librarians, um, archivists, um, uh, our, our chief of public programs. So, you know, the, the, the influences can come from, from various uh, places and people. And uh, I just wanted to show that there was a kind of community that was forming in this, um, in this approach. In the next slide, um, as that was happening, uh, they were, uh, Miriam and, and Eric were also posting to Instagram. Um, and so uh, here you see just some of the works that were in process, um, the works that their collaborators were working on and contributing towards the banquet that uh, culminates in some form on Tuesday in a live um, 
um, talk, um, but again, making um, public uh, their process. And in the final slide here, um, the project itself was to, to create from scratch uh, a website uh, with various elements and people coming together. Um, and, and here you see a still, but it's quite dynamic and I, I do encourage you to, to look at it. But while we stay on this um, slide, I, um, I'm going to I'm going to ask Eric, Eric and Mariam if we can actually share their tips um, to to you all um, possibly on on our website or as a follow up. But they gave um, they gave a breakdown of some of their best practices um, that I want to share with you here. And I'm going to focus on their digital marketing tips. Um, there are five. Um, the first one: document behind the scenes. Humans love watching a process unfold and it builds anticipation. It reminds viewers to stay tuned. Two, document meetings with collaborators, mentors, and community members. If physically unavailable, take screenshots of virtual meetings with permission. Clarify where you will share the images. Don't post someone's face if they don't give you permission. It's awkward to have someone you know, ask to remove the image. I mean, this is, you know, these are important things to think about, but there's a, you know, there's a different way of thinking about how process becomes more visible. Number three, look for other individuals, spaces, organizations working in similar time uh, themes and times as you. Reach out to them personally, inviting them to experience your project. Leave appropriate links in bold. Four, create an easily customizable newsletter with all your project details and links. And five, keep a consistent brand across your channels. Develop a unique and distinct style. The Dewat Yon Banquet pages are vibrant, colorful, exciting, and detail-oriented, as you can see. And uh, they have developed and maintained this style, title, and logo consistent across channels, web pages, and platforms. And I want to leave that. Um, I think it's a really, um, you know, not everyone might might feel comfortable being on various uh, a range of platforms, but I think that uh, what this project in particular um, does demonstrate is how how um, the project actually isn't on just one platform. It it lives in many different ways, and um, and I find that incredibly exciting. So I'll leave it to, uh, there for questions now. Oh my gosh, there is so much insight. Uh, the, my favorite thing is, first of all, do I have everyone's permission to share a screenshot of our a conversation? Because I, I am on social media and yet I'm the worst at documenting behind the scenes. Sometimes I become very quiet and private and only share mindfully, but that's a good reminder to build the, the, the anticipation and to also foster community um, and, other, and other voices. And then the other thing, the best advice I've ever been given is um, to, nothing's ever perfect, especially if it's meant to be shared with the world. And so essentially in your mind, if you're already struggling with something being, the idea of being perfect or not ready, um, then you're going to be very disappointed because everyone has their own perceptions. And so when you're sharing something with the world, they will either love it, hate it, or have some sort of reaction to it. And the best thing is to actually feed off those reactions and the feedback. I, that, and that's something that has stayed with me and kind of dulled the anxiety of sharing something that maybe I feel is not perfect because at the end of the day, everyone will receive it differently and you cannot control that. Um, so I love, there's so many nuggets. Um, and I'm being mindful of the time. So for the next 20 minutes, we're gonna chat um, and answer the questions that we had on the event page and make sure that we get all the points in for everyone who's tuning in right now. Paula, I'm actually gonna start with you. Um, so you've over, you oversee the AGO and RBC Emerging Artist Residencies, research and workshops. You've worked with 30 plus artists since the program's inception. Um, so I feel like you have um, your plethora of insight when it comes to creating a reasonable career path. Would you like to speak a little bit more on that? Um, I, thank you. I, and it's it's a hard question because I'm not sure what a reasonable career path is. Uh, and I think it's quite unique for every person. Um, it certainly is one that I think um, comes back to the root of what, what, what Rebecca started with is is it's work. 
Um, and um, you, you know, you have to be um, caring to yourself in that in that work production. Um, and so um, you have to, in my mind, find a balance between um, um, the create creative sort of work uh, for money and the work for your career. And sometimes they may not actually be the same thing. And, um, and, and so you, you, you run the risk of just kind of running a lot. Um, and, um, and my recommendation would be to, to pick, pick the things you want to kind of prioritize and, and move with those uh, as best as possible. Um, I know, for instance, in my work, I was very much uh, interested in, in zines and, and um, social practice based work that doesn't sell. Um, so in many ways, I had to kind of pivot and move to um, uh, a space that was perhaps focused on admin arts administration. But that's my story. That's not that's, you know, everyone has their own kind of path to follow. So a reasonable career path for me is really about balancing um, priority, uh, you know, health and work and, and finding um, maybe your community that works best for you. You may, you may decide that you want, you, you know, that uh, for some time you want to, to focus in on digital, the digital platforms and then move away into some other um, space. Um, uh, I think keeping that balance in play. I don't know if, if uh, Rebecca or, or Lauren have some thoughts around that too. Yes, please share, um, Rebecca. I know for me that that what stood out was awareness, awareness of your gut instinct, like what, what you are attracted to and what you're drawn to, but then also awareness of your environment is, are you being, are you called, are you um, growing and, and being able to sustain yourself? Um, I think that that awareness is so key. But Rebecca, Lauren, before we move on, is there anything you wanted to add to Paula's observations? I feel like no. Okay. <laughs> For being I, I'll go ahead and add something. I think that uh, I think that Paula, your point about. Um, there being the work that you do for money and the work that you do for your work. I think that it's really important um, to say that that is like a huge reality of this field. And it is a reality that continues um, for your whole life. <laughs> and uh, I think that we can even like, you know, just again, like real talk, I think we can extend that to say like there the work that you do for money may not have anything to do with your artistic practice and that is a reality and it's okay and the balance there is very important to maintain um you know like i think uh it is very very difficult to work a full-time job for money and also maintain an artistic career whatever it is you're doing sorry not even a career a practice maintain an artistic practice um but that is uh what I would think the majority of artists do. Um, so just to just to say, if that's a situation that you're struggling with, um, and that you feel like maybe, you know, it's unusual that you have to do this, I think don't don't feel like that. I would add as well. There's a couple. We talked. Um, you know, there's the there's the making artwork. There's promoting your work. There is the, um, as Paula said, like. Um, you know, if I think of, we're talking about like sustaining, sustaining a career as an artist, um, there's that balance, as I mentioned in my comments about selling work for money now, because you need to actually eat every day as an artist or, and, and kind of like trying to be strategic about how you sell work and who, you know, how you show work and, and with a longer term view. But I think also I, I realize that Lauren and like when we're talking about making money and making work that we're talking about having a, a career that is adjacent to enabling you to continue to make work. And I think it's an interesting to, to think about sometimes, you know, like uh, Paula has talked about her career as uh, she started out as an artist and as an arts administrator. And that is often a career that, you know, that, that, it, that happens a lot. Um, I think there's also the possibility of having you know, protecting your art, your, your headspace for your art practice. And one thing I would say is that often if you start out as an artist and become an arts administrator, 
because you're passionate, you're in that role because you're passionate about arts and you end up using a lot of your creative energies to advance that, that role, which yeah. can deplete your energy and kind of vive for your actual art practice. So sometimes yeah. you might want to actually, you know, have your paid job be something that doesn't take any of your passion and it's just like something you do and you reserve all of your creativity and passion for your own practice that was just yeah I would add that. yeah I completely agree I think that's a really good point I read an article recently about this um RB, uh, uh, CBC radio host who now stocks uh uh, shelves at um, a Whole Foods and loves it. And it's a phenomenal article. I'll try to find it, but um, it, and it's, I feel like it touches on that point exactly. Lauren, so I feel like through our introductions, everyone has touched on mentorship, but Lauren, I just want to kind of throw the question to you. Um, what is your advice when it comes to reaching out to mentors and making the best of their time? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it's, uh, I think that this idea of making the best of a mentor's time is maybe not the best way to think about it. Um, my, I think that um, maybe too often we can think about mentorship as an, as an opportunity to associate ourselves with um, prestige. Uh, so we're looking to people in positions of power. We're looking to people who are older than we are. We're looking to people um, that yeah the people in positions of authority or established uh, people and I think that um, it's very important to consider over an association with privilege to think about an alignment of values so to be very very specific with yourself about what it is that you want what it is that you think is very important and if you are reaching out to somebody make sure you know through researching them that they have demonstrated those values too um because yeah association with prestige and authority is not the is not the like it's not the best way to feed your practice maybe it's um, a better way to feed your career but I think in the end, if you're thinking about like a long-term, if you're thinking about a long-term engagement, like IE over your entire life, um, then yeah, an alignment of values is probably what you wanna be looking for. Um, and then I think uh, I would say on top of that, that um, you need to strike a balance between learning from authority and also maintaining a relevance to your own practice. So that can, um, that can involve, I mean, for me, I always really advocate for um, getting a lot of different opinions and reaching out to a lot of different people. Um, and in that sense, um, you don't get sort of a, you don't get a, a sort of like pinhole idea of what's possible because um, the reality is, is that there are a lot of different ways to do this. You know, you can just see on this panel, like so many different approaches. Um, and maybe there is a portion of what somebody does that really, um, really resonates with you and the rest of it doesn't work and that's okay. You can, you can learn from a lot of different people. Um, and then in terms of making everything, uh, making everything worthwhile for everybody, I guess, I think, um, I think it's good to think about reciprocity as a good model here. So in that sense, um, yeah, being a mentor um, is something that somebody should take seriously and it should take their time and it's important to be respectful of somebody's time. Um, but I think that we can also think about how mentoring is something that can feed the mentor as well. Um, and in that sense, I don't think that it's appropriate for somebody who is seeking a mentor to sort of reach out in a feeling of like maybe subservience or um, that I think you can think about a mentorship relationship as a give and take, as a partnership. Um, yeah, and approach it with an idea of reciprocity, learning from each other. And in that sense, yeah, mentors don't need to be people in positions of authority. A mentorship can be somebody that, um, yeah, can be a friend, somebody that is also asking questions of you. Um, because yeah, I'm sure that you have a lot of answers. 
I love that. Um, I also love everyone kind of like poking holes in the questions. I feel like it's a bit of truth and myth. I think that's uh, important. I think that's actually something that should be taken away from this panel in general. Just um, we have our own con like not misconceptions. We have our own ideas what it means to um, build careers as an artist. And um, we sometimes can reframe it and relook at it in a different way. Being very mindful of the time, I'm actually just going to go right to the next question. Um, this is a good one, I think, Rebecca. Um, so actually, I want to shout out the team behind the scenes. Dana uh, really did her research and helped prep me for this interview, uh, for this panel. And so she actually um, uh, 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 handpicked the panelists and she was very interested in Rebecca's work at I Heart Your Work. Um, and so uh, I thought that pairing Rebecca with the question of how do I write, how do people write about their project, about their art project, um, really resonated in terms of um, just getting noticed as well and getting um, their work commissioned. Rebecca, I don't know if I butchered that question for you, but no. if you take that away. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think writing, being able to uh, write about your work and kind of communicate the story of your work is really important and and really challenging. Um, you know, you can't necessarily be expected to be a um, have a really strong visual art practice and also be um, a good writer. So I would go back to um, some of the uh, comments actually that Paula had in her one of the slides there that was talking um, and, and some of her kind of tips from uh, the Dewat Yan project uh, team members, they're very similar to the kind of thing that I would um, respond to in this question. Um, I think first and foremost is to kind of try and speak plainly, like write clearly and concisely. And um, Paula had a, a note in there, something about if you find it too difficult to explain, it's, you know, you can't really expect somebody else to understand uh, if you can't actually explain it yourself and it's your work. Um, so really trying to like, don't, there can be a tendency in um, in art writing to overcomplicate, use longer words than are necessary. And I would always say the opposite, try and speak uh, as, as plainly and clearly uh, and concisely as possible. And as part of that, you know, have kind of multiple levels of, um, or lengths of, writing for your work. There's the couple of sentences that invite somebody in and sort of, you know, like a, here's a really high level what I'm interested in. And then there's the much deeper, um, the, the piece where you, cause you will get people interested in what you're working on and they want to know more and they kind of, you've got to, you want to be able to feed them more about your practice because the more they understand your practice, the more they're going to support, um, support you in that. And so, um, so having those kind of like different uh, lengths or layers of, you know, of writing about your own work, um, again, like edit that work and really this kind of ties back to the mentorship conversation. Lauren, I really liked what you were saying about, you know, not necessarily going for the, the heavy hitter, you know, big name person, but really thinking about mentorship um, as kind of building your network and reaching out to people that have, that you see synergies between what they're working on uh, and what you're working on or what they have worked on. And I would also say always follow up with those, follow up with those people. Are they willing to introduce you to somebody else? Like think about it as building a network. And those networks are, are um, all points of conversation and exchange about your work that help you hone how you communicate your work in written form, but also in spoken, uh, you know, speaking about your work um, in various different opportunities. And then really, really importantly, and this, this I think is where the I Heart Your Work piece um, comes in, is telling the story of the work, like bringing people into the into the process and sharing work in progress. Like don't, don't wait and show them just that finished thing. I know it can be a very yeah. like vulnerable and um, difficult thing to do. And in some ways, you know, every artist will have a different definition of when their work is finished. Right. Sometimes the difference in two practices is just where one artist decides something is finished and where and where another does. It's always it's a very personal thing. So that can feel vulnerable, but pulling um, but telling the story of making the work and all of those steps along the way and sharing that um, is a really, really important part of speaking about your work. And really crucially, it's actually part of a promotion like it gives you more more moments to talk about your work 
and share your work. And there is this, um, this kind of familiarity or recognition that builds up once people have kind of been seen your work over and over again. And they're kind of, uh, for whatever reason, we're creatures of, you know, liking things that we feel familiar. Once people feel like they've seen your work more, they want to see, you know, they're, they're, they're more amenable to seeing more of it. So I would just say, tell the story and try and be clear about it. Thank you. I would, if I can add something to that. Go ahead. Um, thanks. I, re I really advocate for, um, if you're an artist, you don't need to be able to write about your work. Like there is, it, you know, it, it is very, very difficult to write about art. It's almost impossible to write about your own practice and your own work. Um, and you don't have to. <laughs> I think that there are there are an enormous number of um, really incredible people at every level of their career who are really interested in learning about art practices and writing texts for you. And if you have like the financial resources to pay them, that's excellent. If you can work out some kind of barter situation, either like you give somebody a work of art or, you know, I think there obviously that kind of work needs to be um, needs to be compensated, but I really would encourage people who don't feel comfortable writing about their own work. You can reach out to a friend who's a curator, a friend who's a writer and say, hey, can you write, can you interview me about my work? Can you take a look at this and write my artist statement for me? Or you write something and then you send it to somebody to be um, edited. You know, writing is a collaborative process too. So yeah, I think if you're struggling to write and communicate about your work, that is very, very normal. And it's also um, very, very normal to reach out for help because um, there are people who, who enjoy do, doing this and probably want to learn more about your work. And there's a reciprocity in that as well. Like exactly. it kind of gives work for um, emerging writers if you're an emerging artist. And those, you know, it's all part exactly. of the system that needs to support itself. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. I think too, if I may add, um, uh, I see also there's a question, you know, if you're new to the, you know, you, you've been out of the art world or you're not, you know, you're in Toronto and you don't know anyone, um, you know, it is important to to um, find find uh, find people who might uh, have similar likes, uh, and you know, maybe it's a formal way, maybe it's a you know a school or 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 something else or a writing group, and and you get to a place where um, where you might start to meet people. Um, but I think what um, this year we our theme this year was friendships near and far. And in many ways, I think um, Miriam and, and Eric and, and the others who are coming in uh, as, as artists um, kind of trouble the idea of, um, of, of mentorship um, in that, it, and, and I think you, um, you both, uh, Lauren and, and Rebecca speak to this, it, it is about sort of forming community um, and friendships sometimes. And, and it does also mean then that money doesn't have to be your central focus. Um, in in the development of your of your voice um, or of sharing your voice and um, and I think um, oftentimes that that actually um, is is like it it's like a it's like you're kind of bouncing off ideas and um, and this idea of community is really um, interesting to me um, a lot of practices are are not it's kind of that solo, solo person. They're, they're like, it really is actually a collaboration often with, uh, you know, I don't know how to do graphic design. You come in and do the graphics and I'll, you know, and so um, it, it is pretty bouncy. Um, and, and, you know, if one can look at that as a kind of, you know, oh, a chore, but also quite fun. Um, so, you know, hopefully we can keep some fun in, in this, in this view. Thank you. Those are incredible insights. Um, we do have a couple of questions, but being, again, being mindful of the time, I'm actually going to, um, uh, we had a question from Twinkle, uh, who had, uh, for Lauren, I think it was when you were um, speaking on your introduction, um, they asked, for people of color whose primary language may not be English and who don't come from an academic background, what are your, what are some of the steps MOMIS is taking to accommodate and educate that demographic? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think that's incredibly pressing as we, um, you know, I guess as an industry or try to move away from this idea of like international art speak and also try to decentralize English. 
Um, so myself as somebody who I work um, in contexts of many different languages across Europe and the, and the Middle East, um, like translation and um, communication across language is really important. So for um, the steps that we're taking are mostly in the programmatic form. So within the residencies, there's a lot of discussion of um, particularly in Leuli's recent residency for Indigenous folk and, and the texts that have been commissioned is thinking about how um, Indigenous languages or mother tongues can be represented in texts um, and that there's a choice about translation, you know, that it does not need to be translated back into English if the word exists um, in the language for you, then it functions there as well. Um, we're also thinking about for the critical writing or fellowship with IBEAM, the idea of having um, a translation fellowship. And um, in terms of working with people from non-academic backgrounds, one of the main um, thrusts for our fundraising initiatives is to find people, find organizations that are willing to fund people who are not associated with universities. So often like a university will be happy to pay for one of their students to go to this residency. But what we're do, trying to do is provide an alternative to that. So if we can find funders who are who are willing to fund, you know, unaffiliated people. And then also, I think, just in the idea of who's selected to lead the residencies. So having artists, having people who don't have traditional um, career paths. So allowing people to connect with, um, yeah, with people who don't have necessarily academic backgrounds um, and see how they made it work. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. I think that's um, the fact that you can answer that is already incredible that it's a work in progress for always. I think mm -hmm. um, uh, living somewhere like Toronto, I know you're tuning in from Brussels. Um, it can be a lot to be able to accommodate variety of cultures and language barriers, but um, I, I was, I wanted to definitely ask that question over the last two that I had, because I thought it was such an important one. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think everyone's okay with it, but because you were answering, Lauren, someone asked if they can take a photo of the panel. Uh, so just wanted to get your permission on that. Um, but also, um, I, I'm actually going to wrap up our conversation. I'm going to apologize to anyone who weren't able to answer your questions. Um, I wasn't even able to ask the last two, but what I will say is that as I share my screen one last time, and I can't do two things at once, um, that um, I did learn the last workshop that was uh, held last week did touch a little bit on money. That was my next question was how to create a budget forecast, but maybe to the powers that be, um, they might be, someone might be able to slip that question in, in another, um, in another conversation upcoming. And, and in regards to upcoming conversations, these are, uh, this is a talk and a workshop that you can look forward to in, um, the coming, well, yeah, in next week. Today's the 22nd, right? Or I don't, I'm, I'm Friday brain today. But um, I, if anyone has, unless anyone has, oh, actually, oh my goodness, now I'm getting way ahead of myself because I'm trying to make sure that I wrap up on a time, on a timely basis because it is Friday evening. Um, so fi one final uh, big thank you to our signature partner, RBC, for supporting the AGO Times RBC Emerging Artists Workshops. Um, but we do have a poll that's about to come up. Abbas, I think that's your, a call for you. And so if everyone can take a minute to um, just answer this. And while you do, if anyone has any last words on the panel, I will give the floor up. But otherwise, we can we can just give a moment to the poll. Um, well, I just want to say thank you, Megan, Rebecca, Lauren. I feel like we just scratched the surface, but I hope it was useful to many. Um, and um, and I would encourage you all to to check out and even connect with Lauren, Rebecca, or myself, or Megan. Um, I you know we're we're like we're in the public <laughs> realm. So um, thank you. Thanks for 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 this moment. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure. 
Yeah, thanks everybody. I, I feel like there's so much more to talk about that I, I'm really excited about what I've just seen lined up for the next couple of weeks. So hopefully it'll happen there. Yes, I see some people are starting to filter out, probably heading out for dinner. The sun is still shining a little bit here in Toronto, at least. So thank you so much um, for your feedback, for tuning in, um, especially to the panelists. I am so honored to have been here and heard all of the nuggets of advice that you had. Um, but it's true. There's so much more. So um, feel free to reach out to everyone. And um, if you are able to and tune into the next talks and workshops, because um, there's more to learn. Have a great evening, everyone.